The following program is a special presentation of Pioneer Public Television. Meet the Candidates is brought to you by Pioneer Public Television. The next hour is intended to encourage debate and educate you, the voter, about the candidates running for office. The end result is for voters to be able to make an informed decision on election day. Participate in the process by sending in your questions. Next up are the candidates for Senate District 8. Dan Scogan from Hewitt and Bill Ingebrigtsen from Alexandria. Welcome to Pioneer Public Television's Meet the Candidates, and thank you for joining us this evening for the Senate District 8 candidates. The goal of this program is to introduce you to your candidates and hopefully to encourage you to vote. We will be starting this evening with opening statements. We will then take a break to give you an opportunity to call in your questions and then we will uh, close up with, wrap, uh, with closing statements. Tonight's candidates are running for the Senate District 8 seat. We will be taking a look at uh, the map of that district in just a moment, but first let's meet those candidates. We have the DFL candidate from Hewitt, and that is Dan Scogan. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Amy. And then we also have the Republican candidate from Alexandria, Bill Ingebrigtsen. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for having us. Now let's take a look at the map for Senate District 8. Please be aware that your Senate seat has changed, so look at the map to make sure that you are in the voting area for this Senate District. Senate District 8 includes northeastern Douglas County and nearly all of Outer Tail County except for the northeastern corner. Cities in Senate District 8 include Fergus Falls, Pelican Rapids, Parham, New York Mills, Parker's Prairie, and most of Alexandria, to name a few. If this is your district, I encourage you to call in now with your questions. Please try and gear your questions towards both candidates and not towards a single candidate so we can have a more of an interactive debate. We will now start with the three-minute opening statements from both of the candidates, and after the opening statements, we'll take a short break to take your questions. And uh, the coin toss was won by Dan Scogan. So, Dan, you may start with your opening statement. Thank you, Amy. And uh, thank you for tuning in tonight, and thank you to uh, Public TV for giving us this opportunity to make you a, a more informed voter, we hope. I'm Dan Scogan. I uh, have been a lifelong resident of Otter Tail County. Uh, grew up uh, north of Battle Lake, uh, went to high school there. Also, uh, for the past uh, 30 years, have worked in the, uh, uh, lived in Otter Tail County, but worked at the Wadena radio stations. I have a wife, uh, Dee, who is an outstanding artist. She uh, uh, has been my wife for the last uh, 33 years. We have two adult sons, uh, an uh, Air Force veteran who is living in Murphy, North Carolina with a wife and three grandchildren. He is an insurance agent out there for State Farm and uh, has his own agency now. And then our youngest son, uh, Noah, is uh, out in San Diego and works for Time Warner in the uh, cable industry. Uh, I uh, previously served in uh, 2007 through 2010. I was a state senator for Senate District 10 at that time, which was all of uh, Otter Tail, part of Becker and uh, Wadena County, and then was defeated in 2010 and then trying to win my way and uh, win your vote, uh, heading back to uh, St. Paul to do uh, the good work of this area of the state as well as the state of Minnesota. And I look forward to that challenge. It certainly has been a challenge with the uh, new uh, districts and boundaries, uh, introducing myself to eight new townships in Douglas County, including uh, Carlos and Miltona, Nelson, and of course uh, the, uh, most of the city of Alexandria as well. But it has been a, a challenge that I've, uh, I guess I've kind of wrapped my arms around and have enjoyed. I also served 10 years on the Todd Wadena Electric Co-op Board of Directors, one year as their president, and of course have uh, served on uh, many of the uh, local uh, civic organizations as well as uh, past president in Wadena Rotary and in my church. Look forward to tonight's debate. Thank you, Dan. Now the opening comments from Bill Ingebrigtsen. Bill? Thank you very much. And thank you to the Pioneer Public TV for, uh, for inviting us, uh, for the folks that, that really are looking for a choice. And, and that's what elections are all about. And again, I appreciate being here and appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Bill Ingebrigtsen. I uh, reside in Alexandria, have, have been a 40-year uh, resident of Alexandria where I, uh, I and Marilyn raised our two children. Uh, I was a uh, law enforcement officer with the Douglas County Sheriff's Department <clears throat> for 
for approximately 34 years. Uh, the last 16 of those years, I was the elected sheriff. Uh, the last three terms of that, actually, I ran unopposed. In 2006, uh, I decided to run for the state senate and have been in the senate ever since. And this is my third uh, third bid at uh, running for the uh, for the for the state senate. Marilyn and I have two children. We have uh, six beautiful grandchildren. Uh, my daughter Linnea, who lives in Garfield uh, with her husband Chad, and has three children, as well as my son, in living in Cannon Falls with Alyssa. Uh, they have three children, so they all reside in in Minnesota. Um, in the Senate, uh, when elected uh, the same time, uh, Dan, Dan actually and I came into the Senate at the same time in 2007. And uh, for the first four years, I was in the minority. The last two years, uh, we were sent uh, by the voters to take over the Senate for the first time in 38 years. Since then, of course, I was uh, uh, put on the uh, chair of the Environmental Natural Resource Committee, both Budget and Finance Committee. Or, or excuse me, finance and, and uh, policy committee. I also serve on the Judiciary Public Safety Committee, which I'm a member of, for obvious reasons. I think I bring my law enforcement background there, and and uh, that's what happens in the legislature. You draw from from uh, everyone's profession that are down there, the 201 of us. Uh, my third committee that I sit on is the uh, uh, Senate Finance Committee, which is a very interesting interesting committee where every bill that comes before the uh, Senate has to pass through there that, that expends one dollar. So it's been very, a very interesting but a very rewarding experience to be on the Finance Committee. And I also serve on the Senate Ethics Committee as well as the, uh, since its inception, the Lessard Sam's Outdoor Heritage uh, Committee, which uh, uh, deals with the financing of the three-eighths of one percent of the uh, sales tax that the uh, the electorate actually voted into the Constitution back in excuse me in 2000 and uh, in 2008. So, I've uh, uh, done good things in the Senate. I've enjoyed it. Uh, they say you have to have tough skin. I think the life before me, uh, the, life, the the career that I had before, gave me that. Uh, you have to have fire in the belly. I still have that, and I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to another four years uh, serving people in West Central Minnesota in the Senate. Thank you, Bill. Now is your time to call in with your questions. Please call 1-800-726-3178 or email your questions to yourtv at pioneer.org. While your questions are being gathered, we'll take a short break and look at some of the great programming on Pioneer Public Television. Thank you. Thanks for watching Meet the Candidates on Pioneer Public Television. After this short break, we'll return to the question and answer portion. We encourage you at this time to either call in or email your questions to the studio for the candidates to address. We return now to our question okay. and answer portion of the program. We encourage you to become involved by sending us a question by phone or email. I'll begin with the questions, but please be encouraged to call in more questions or email your questions during the rest of the program. Our first question will go to Bill. Each question will have two minutes, the uh, candidates will have two minutes to answer a question. Bill, the first question for you. A lot of the national debate centers on job creation. Can you describe one bill you would work to pass or maybe one law you would work to repeal that you believe would have a direct impact on creating jobs in this area? Thank you for the question. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I actually was part of the legislation uh, in the state of Minnesota the last two years that actually did deal with this very thing. Uh, as, as the viewers know, the MPCA and the DNR uh, have, uh, have a lot of authority in the state of Minnesota and uh, getting permits out to businesses for expansion or, or just new businesses coming into the community uh, uh, has always been somewhat of an issue of getting the permits out in a timely fashion. And the legislation that I authored along with Representative Fabian from Roseau uh, and signed by the governor uh, will actually hurry up that process to a 150-day process when there was a, a total open-ended permitting process at that, at, uh, before that legislation came through. Also included in that legislation was, was the uh, elimination of the uh, court process for those appeals. Actually, we eliminated the district court process and they go directly now into the Court of Appeals. So that type of legislation has already been, been uh, worked on by myself uh, and, and, again, worked with the administration very closely in a bipartisan fashion to get that done. Uh, some success stories that I know of, at least one up in, up in Bemidji, is Norboard. 
Uh, they were able to expand their business in a quicker fashion. And of course, in Minnesota, as you know, uh, the, uh, the, the season of building is, is, is very short uh, due to our extreme winters. And part of this bill actually allowed the, the businesses to go ahead and build before the permit was actually issued. Uh, so they had that option to do that if they wanted to. So we think that was a real good piece of legislation that's already helped businesses in the state of Minnesota, and we need to do more. Thank you. Dan, can you describe one bill you would work to pass or maybe one law you would work to repeal that you believe would have a direct impact on creating jobs in the area? I think uh, Bill was absolutely right in that we need to continue to work on streamlining. It's something that legislators have talked about probably for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the legislature this past session took some real steps in trying to speed up that process while still keeping some safeguards in place. Uh, when I think about job creation, I think about the bonding bill, and I supported uh, several bonding bills. Uh, when I served in the four years, we had our two regular bonding bills, and we had another uh, supplemental bonding bill that created real jobs, and it, made, it, it created jobs that were uh, ready uh, when the uh, bonding bill came out. Uh, I think of uh, the uh, road projects in Fergus Falls and in Staples, the overpass uh, bridge in Staples, uh, a uh, bicycle trail, uh, that's being built in Glendale State Park right now as we speak. Uh, a small uh, piece of pavement that was put in on the uh, north side of, of uh, Maplewood State Park and uh, the uh, waste to energy uh, plant that was uh, expanded in Purim that actually took the garbage of uh, that area of Ottertail County and as they burned it down and created the steam, uh, sent it underground uh, in, under the streets of Purim and allowed uh, KLN Enterprises and others, Bond Guard Creameries, to use that steam to enhance uh, their products. So uh, I supported all of those, carried some pieces of that uh, myself in the bonding bill, and, and it created real jobs. And uh, uh, so uh, for quick jobs, uh, for jobs that to build on infrastructure, for jobs that help uh, keep our uh, colleges and universities safe and uh, secure and, up, uh, and work on the upkeep on those, uh, I, I like bonding projects. Dan, how would you reform LGA, local government aid, to benefit small rural communities? Well, that's an interesting question, Amy, uh, in that LGA is uh, the piece, I believe, that helps hold down our property taxes out here. There's no guarantee uh, that uh, those property taxes will be held down uh, if LGA payments are made, but it certainly uh, is a catalyst to help uh, local units of government push back on them. Uh, recently, uh, of course, you go back into the, even the 2008 session when uh, Governor Pawlenty started to unallot LGA, it really put a lot of pressure on small communities. And I just think we need to be honest with ourselves that if we want uh, to have uh, services, and a, a lot of them are public uh, safety issues, uh, add that policeman, uh, make sure that fire equipment is up to date or that the people who are going to volunteer and use that uh, first responder and fire equipment have had the proper training, we want to move snow in a timely fashion, uh, that's where LGA comes in. Uh, when you start cutting and then freezing LGA, uh, you put some of these uh, important public services at risk. And, uh, you know, uh, City of Alexandria, 12 or 13% of their budget is LGA. You get into smaller communities and you get into that 30 and 40%. And when you start uh, cutting away 30 or 40% of a small community's budget, uh, you find that uh, they, uh, they cannot do more with less or even the same with less uh, when it goes on and on. So I've been a big advocate. I believe that some of these uh, high uh, uh, property tax cities uh, can afford to help us provide a kind of a level playing field for uh, the residents of the state of Minnesota and certainly the residents in uh, Senate District 8, and LGA is a good way to do that. I'm an advocate of it. I would uh, support uh, moving forward with uh, reinstating some of those cuts. Thank you. Bill, how would you reform LGA to benefit small rural communities? Well, of course, uh, thank you for that question. It, it's always a contentious issue, but it's something that we rural legislators have all in common, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, that was put in place back, uh, back some years ago uh, to, uh, to allow uh, smaller cities uh, the uh, same amount of uh, infrastructure things uh, that, for instance, sewer water and things that that are very expensive for the uh, smaller tax base to be able to have, similar to what the, the uh, metro and suburb uh, folks are, are able to enjoy. Uh, I will have to say that, uh, that, that the cities, and the cities uh, that, that have had LGA have handled it all quite a bit differently. 
Some actually make it a very big part of their budget. I don't think it was intended for that. I think it was intended as a supplement. And some of those cities that actually, when we had the budget crunch with the $5.6 billion deficit we had to deal with two years ago, all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden now they're, you know, they're, they're worried about not getting their LGA, which in fact we actually did freeze the LGA, so the LGA did stay the same uh, over the last two-year two year period, which was very, you know, it was very challenging for us who had to balance that budget. Uh, but they have to be very careful not to include that and have that a, a very large part of their operating budget. And a lot of cities, I think, have gotten themselves into trouble because of that. But I, I'm certainly fine with, uh, with uh, continuing with LGA for, uh, for the rural communities. Uh, without that, I don't think, uh, you know, sm smaller Minnesota, if you will, uh, is going to be able to afford those types of, of, uh, of uh, and it, you know, different things such as water and sewer and, and uh, things like that. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm, f I'm all for keeping uh, LGA to rural Minnesota. Dan, would you like a rebuttal? Uh, just uh, maybe a continuation of my statement, Amy. Uh, you know, uh, the other thing that occurs uh, out here, we have a wonderful place to come and spend time. And the people who come to our communities expect some of those same amenities that they have in their bigger cities or more wealthy cities. And LGA helps us provide some of that, especially in the public safety it, uh, realm and, and uh, in uh, police and fire protection. Thank you. Bill, would you like a rebuttal? You know, actually I would. Uh, you know, the police and fire thing I think was thrown around an awful lot during the uh, squabbles with the LGA over the years. And, and a lot of times, quite frankly, those are scare tactics. And I, and I wish people would stay away from that because those functions are, are functions that, 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 that should be figured in on your general taxation of your local communities. Again, I was talking about earlier, when you start figuring those types of things in, uh, by using your LGA, uh, quite frankly, that's not what it was intended for. It's intended for those, all of a sudden the water main breaks and we come up with a $500,000 or a million dollar uh, operation in the Garfield, Minnesota that you have to do. So you know, you've got to be careful with, with some of those things that you hear. All right, thank you. Bill, do you think the homestead credit should be reinstated? You know, that's a, that's a dirty little secret coming out of St. Paul this year, and, and I think the uh, air really needs to be cleared up on that. Uh, the Homestead Credit uh, was, uh, issue was brought to us by the League of Minnesota Cities and the Association of Minnesota Counties. It was brought to us because 10 years ago, the DFL Senate uh, was, in, was included in the process of actually passing that law, and it turned out to be an unfunded mandate, quite frankly, uh, and, and, it's, and it's on record. You can prove the fact that it's only paid for itself one out of the t last 10 years. So that is the reason they came to us this year, or this biennium, to, uh, to do away with that. And by doing away with that, then they would not have to figure that in on their revenue. So it was, it was, something, that was, uh, it was something that they wanted us to do. And uh, however thing politics ever happens, the bottom line is uh, all of a sudden uh, when that goes away, uh, they were really quick to turn at the legislature and point the finger and say we did away with that, which in fact we did, but it was under their suggestion and it was an unfunded mandate we suggested and Dan knows this we've always ta told cities and counties to come with us come to us with unfunded mandates and we'll try and get rid of them we did we should also know that statewide the property taxes because of this is actually only, only going to increase it will increase 2.3 percent uh, but it's a lot less than it has been over the last six or excuse me over the last 10 years which is 6.97 percent so it actually is going to show a decrease in property taxes Dan, do you support the homestead credit? Uh, do you think the homestead credit should be reinstated? Yes, I do. Uh, the uh, homestead uh, credit has been in place uh, for 44 years now. It was originally uh, fully funded. It certainly has not been fully funded the last few years, uh, but it has been a, a true uh, property tax reduction for homeowners, for small business people, for uh, agricultural land. And to eliminate it the way it was eliminated this time uh, has uh, changed things dramatically. And at the same time, uh, uh, abandon rural Minnesota. Uh, the uh, property tax increase that is going to occur is uh, actually from, from this alone is cl actually closer to about 8%. Well, in the metro area, it's about 2.4% that uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen is talking about. So it is uh, an unfair uh, tax increase on... Uh, people in west central Minnesota and out here where we live we have a lot of agriculture we have a lot of elderly people who are on fixed incomes and uh, there are places uh, in Wadena County where small businesses are seeing uh, some property tax increases close to 30 percent 
with that elimination. So uh, I would advocate, uh, you know, North Dakota trying to drive some economic development uh, is adding to their homestead tax credit this year. Uh, they're making plans to add more to it uh, to try to relieve some of that property tax burden, and uh, I would adv advocate for that as well. Thank you. Dan, do you support drug testing for welfare applicants? Well, I think, uh, I think on, at first blush I would say no. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, uh, we don't uh, drug test our uh, senators and uh, we don't drug test other people who uh, receive uh, state funding or federal funding and, and uh, I guess uh, people who work with uh, people who are in need of some help, uh, a hand up, uh, need to be responsive if they sense a problem. We have lots of uh, safety nets in place. Uh, it does not eliminate all of the fraud. It certainly, uh, we uh, read all the bad stories, but uh, uh, the welfare system helps uh, many, many people, young children, elderly, veterans, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the people who don't want government any deeper into their lives all of a sudden want uh, government to be uh, drug testing. I think the cost would be uh, prohibitive. I think uh, uh, the mistakes that could be made and put people in harm's way, uh, we have to be very, very careful when we start uh, painting these wide brushes of uh, who should then and who shouldn't be drug tested? Should uh, people be drug tested if they're going to get behind a, the wheel of a car or apply for a driver's license? Or, uh, I, no, I don't think so. Bill, do you support drug testing for welfare applicants? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, I do, actually. And quite frankly, the uh, truck drivers that are, that are up and down the highway uh, uh, working on the road uh, uh, paying taxes in the state of Minnesota have been very loud and very, very uh, animate about, you know, if I'm going to have to uh, be d uh, random drug tested uh, for working and actually paying taxes and, and paying for welfare, uh, what would be so wrong about asking the recipients of, of uh, welfare uh, in our state to, uh, to uh, also do random drug testing? I don't think there's any problem with that. In fact, I've, I've either authored or co-authored, and I will do it again, uh, that very such, a, such bill. Uh, frankly, uh, uh, Senator Scogan talked about they don't do it to senators. Maybe we should. I'd be more than happy to step up and do that if that becomes a real issue. But the real issue is, is people see the abuse that's going on. That's what it's all about. And I think Dan understands that. The abuse in, in our system right now is going on. And frankly, the, the working public is paying and working hard and paying their taxes. And, and frankly, they're, they're, they're upset when they see people walking around that are... That are uh, uh, either either uh, smell of alcohol, smell of tobacco, and, uh, and occasionally get involved in drug activity. And I think, uh, quite frankly, uh, it would be money very well spent. And uh, some states have already done that, where if you if you uh, get caught the first time and, and uh, uh, you are on uh, on drugs, uh, there's a rehabilitation uh, uh, piece that kicks in. If you get caught the second time, uh, you cannot come back for welfare. So I think the public's kind of crying for that right now has been for some time. I think it would be a good idea to do that. Dan, do you have a rebuttal? Uh, thank you, Amy. I would just add to that that if a s social worker or a welfare uh, worker suspects fraud, uh, su suspects abuse of some kind, they're obligated to turn it in. So is Bill, so am I. If we suspect fraud or, or uh, we, uh, there are certain channels you can go down. And, uh, you know, the uh, people who get welfare also spend that money. And uh, small businesses see them come into their grocery stores, filling up their gas tanks. And uh, people that need help aren't necessarily a dredge on society. There are people that need help for specific reasons. A lot of them are not on help for a long period of time. And uh, this would just, and, and I don't know how Bill would expect to pay for this. It, it is not a free pass to have uh, people take these drug tests. Bill, would you like a rebuttal? Yes, I would. Actually, the truck drivers pay for their drug tests uh, at random, and uh, I think it's the very least we can expect from those that uh, that are, are receiving services that the uh, from the taxes that the very truck driver is earning for them, and actually paying them. Uh, I don't think you know. I don't think anybody's out to try and to try and uh, uh, catch anybody that's on drugs. We all know. I mean, I know from the profession that I come from that there were an awful lot of drug abuse uh, going on, and and there still is. And and quite frankly, it would be a deterrent if you know that you're going to be at randomly tested uh, to get uh, uh, to get help uh, from the county or the or the state of Minnesota. Uh, it would certainly help uh, defray some of the abuse that's been going on. All right, Bill, 
What is your view on photo IDs for voting? Thank you for that question. Photo ID is something that uh, is part, going to be part of the constitutional amendment, at least I hope it is in November. Uh, it was something that I supported, I voted for. In fact, I actually uh, was on one of the bills that, uh, that came forward this, this last uh, session uh, for the obvious reasons. Uh, ACORN, if people remember that, uh, is, is, was, was very active in, in uh, some uh, illegal activity when it comes to uh, uh, bringing people to the, uh, to the polls or stopping people from going to the polls or, or bringing people in that were not registered to vote. Uh, Any time that our voting system is jeopardized, I don't care what state you're from, and it happened all over the United States, Minnesota was one of the worst, there was an outcry for that. So the legislation came through the very first year, uh, two years ago, when the, when the uh, Republicans took over the legislature. The, the bill was actually passed out of the House and the Senate and given to the governor for signature. He vetoed that bill. It was taken back. And uh, there was an, still a public outcry to the point where we felt it was important in our leadership position to put it on, a, on as a constitutional amendment. Now, I don't take constitutional amendments lightly. Uh, they're very serious, and, and, and they should be taken very seriously. Uh, but it, it is going to be on the constitutional ballot. It's going to be on the ballot. It's going to give you, the voters, an opportunity to say, can, you, can, you, can we put up an ID to, to prove exactly who we are and where we come from in the state of Minnesota before we vote? We certainly have to do that to write a check in our everyday lives. To be able to go anywhere as you have to have a photo ID. Uh, it's something that the, uh, the polling in the state of Minnesota has been upwards of 70 to 80 percent at different times. The folks want it. It was serious enough to put on the ballot and I think in order to get some, some integrity back into our voting system we have to have that. So I'm looking forward to voting for that myself. Dan, what is your view on photo ID for voting? Well, my, Amy, it's not ready for prime time yet. I, uh, I don't think uh, we can afford it, and I don't think we need it. Minnesota has a wonderful voting record. Clean, fair, honest uh, elections. Even after the last two elections where uh, we had these long recounts, uh, we uh, were not prosecuting people for all kinds of uh, voter fraud. We were not finding all kinds of people that were uh, moving from polling place to polling place, coming and going in the dark of the night. And uh, it is a scare tactic that uh, has been uh, run up the flagpole for some reason. If you want to fundamentally change how we vote in Minnesota, then vote for the, uh, the uh, voter ID amendment. It is going to change everything. It's going to change absenteeism. This is part of the problem with the whole constitutional amendment. It hasn't got the rules and regulations figured out yet, nor the cost. But it'll change how you vote. It'll change your ability to a same-day register. It'll change your absenteeism. It'll affect some servicemen and women. Uh, it'll affect some students. It'll s affect some workers who work outside of the state of Minnesota for a long time. There are provisional ballots. And if anybody's explained those, the city uh, clerk was asking me, how many more people do we have to put on to hold those provisional ballots while we wait for the election results and then is it a day or two later that they get to uh, go to those provisional ballots to see if uh, there was any voter fraud? Uh, that, and then I, I, maybe, maybe I'm naive, but I think someone who is committing or attempting to commit voter fraud now is going to find a way to get a, a photo ID. And then the last piece for me is why put something in the Constitution that in a few years could be technologically ancient? Photo ID? We're going to have retina scans, we're going to have skin samples, we're going to have better ways to identify people, and they want to put in the Constitution that we have to use a photo. It'll be antiquated in just a few years and very, very costly. Thank you. Bill, would you like a rebuttal? Yes, I would, actually. That's, that's interesting Dan would bring that up. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that, uh, that, that he would be, I don't know if he said he would be in favor of the, uh, of the more antiquated uh, uh, system of uh, retina, retina scanning and things like that, but you know, it, it really seems quite funny to me, and this is probably one of the hottest topics that I, that I talk about when I go door to door out there uh, with the constituents, and, and that is why, why is anybody even arguing with this? Why is anybody fighting this? And you know, I have to ask myself the same thing. I, I, uh, I, I've been in the legislature now for uh, six years, and I have never seen anything so divided in, in all my, in all my my career there, it is so Democrat and Republican, and I have to ask myself why. Why are the Democrats so afraid of this when they have to pull one out, pull an ID out to do anything in, anymore in, in this state or in the country for that matter, and why you can't do that to vote 
is, is just beyond a lot of the folks' thought process. Dan, would you like a rebuttal? Yes, thank you, Amy. And, you know, voting is uh, a lot of people paid uh, their lives so that we could vote free. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, a barrier for some people that would like to vote. I also just, uh, you know, want to point out that if this passes, it would quite possibly be the largest unfunded mandate in this state's history. The League of Minnesota Cities does not know uh, how much this is going to cost. state of Minnesota doesn't have the money. We're going to push it down to the counties, the townships, the cities, and they will pay for it with property taxes. Thank you, gentlemen. Next question, we'll start with Dan. Where do you stand on the marriage amendment? Well, the uh, second, uh, you know, after being promised in 2010 by the uh, the new leadership that we were going to be laser focused on jobs, uh, we come up with two constitutional amendments: uh, one on a, uh, a voter ID and uh, the other on a marriage amendment. Look, I grew up. I'm 54 years old. I grew up understanding that marriage was between a man and a woman. I'm comfortable with that. Very comfortable with it. I've been married to Dee for 33 years, in a loving relationship. Never regretted it a day in my life. I think other people who are in love should be able to experience those same things. The other thing, when I look at our Constitution, it should be a very, very thin document. It should be talk about process and how we move forward and how we move forward as a whole people and uh, that we don't leave anybody in our wake when we move forward. And uh, I think this uh, marriage amendment uh, just uh, opens the door for discrimination. Uh, it uh, is a clear example that uh, some people are going to be second-class citizens in this state, and we have a statute in the books already that says marriage in the state of Minnesota is between a man and a woman. This is a uh, constitutional amendment that is not needed. Thank you. Bill, where do you stand on the marriage amendment? Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, I was the uh, second co-author on that bill in the legislature, and uh, I'm very proud to, be, to have that opportunity to be on that legislation. Now, I say that somewhat, somewhat not guarded necessarily, but a lot of work has, been, has gone into the uh, marriage amendment, the, uh, the constitutional amendment a piece of legislation. Over the past 12 years, that has been bantered back and forth by uh, legislators that have both come and gone, and a lot of hard work has gone on, and it was never had a chance to get on the ballot uh, like the other 34 states until the, the Republicans were in control of one of the bodies. Because if everybody knows that if you put a constitutional amendment on the ballot, uh, you have to have uh, obviously passed out of both bodies. So that has been, been held up for, for, for the 12 years has been talked about. Uh, two, years, of course, uh, two years ago, of course, we were uh, voted into the uh, majority, and uh, we had an, our first opportunity to do that. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what I think about uh, gay marriage one way or the other. I, I, I just felt it was my function, and, and I still feel this very strongly, that it's my function to put it on the ballot. It has been discussed m for many years by many people that, again, that have come and gone before Dan and I have been in the legislature. And it'll be put to, to rest one, you know, one way or the other, November 6th. They have an opportunity. That was my function, was to put it on the ballot. And uh, I, I agree with it. I, I, I know that there's a there's a state law, but there's a reason why constitutional amendments are put on the, are, are, are amended, and that is because we have, we have uh, attorneys that seek out uh, both liberal and both conservative judges to overrule those types of laws, and that's what's been going on, the trend that's been going on in the United States, and that's why you're seeing us being one of the top, one of the 30, one of the 30 uh, states that is now going to put that on the ballot. Thank you, Phil. Bill. Can you name three areas where the state government needs to reduce spending? Thank you. Um, well, Health and Human Services budget, of course, is our huge, you know, our biggest budget. I'll tell you exactly what we came into two years ago. We came into a Health and Human Service budget that was that was on track without us showing up in St. Paul to actually increase by 22 percent. That is without any type of a statute brought forward. That was autopilot. That, that, that's government on autopilot. And that's exactly the reason we were sent there was to stop that, to stop that kind of spending that was going on. We did. Uh, we were strapped, of course, with a huge deficit to deal with. And uh, Senator Han, who chaired up, was the new chair of the uh, Health and Human Services uh, budget, actually uh, ended up cutting that budget 
approximately $1.3 billion, and that still reflected a 5% increase, a 5% increase even with that kind of a cut. Now, fr frankly, folks, for the last two years, we've gotten by just fine. Um, but the Constitution says we have to balance the budget here in the state of Minnesota, unlike the federal government. Another area that, was, that, was, that needed some trimming, and, and I was part of that. I trimmed over $33 million from the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the DNR. Those agencies had been, had been bloated to the point where, where they're almost out of control. And I think the, the general public knows what I'm talking about when I say that. Uh, another area that we could certainly look at cutting would be, uh, uh, would be uh, uh, looking at, at the possibility of doing some, uh, some infrastructure cutting. But I think if we, if we, could, we cut some bills such as the, uh, uh, the uh, prevailing wage law, which is costing our, our uh, uh, construction both building and road construction in the state of Minnesota, anywhere between 20 and 20 and 30 percent more money just because of the union-driven prevailing wage. If we were to get rid of that, we would actually save a lot of money in the state of Minnesota. Those would be the three areas that I would look at. Thank you. Dan, name three areas where the state needs to reduce spending. Well, uh, Amy, I would not uh, do it. Why start at the prevailing wage? Why start with the workers who have uh, uh, good-paying jobs with benefits, in the, in the end of the day, they have disposable income that they plug back into the community. I think you're uh, taking a uh, hatchet approach uh, to uh, going after uh, people that aren't the problem. There are some places where I think the state of Minnesota, I agree with Senator Ingebrigtsen and uh, DNR and MPCA. Uh, this is a very large, uh, dysfunctional at times uh, organization, and I think that uh, they could be uh, held to task a little more on uh, what kind of funds they get and how those monies are spent. I also think that uh, in, uh, higher, or in uh, K-12 education, I think that we have to uh, take a serious look at the kind of money that we spend on transportation when we allow schools to chase after students for open enrollment. I don't disagree with open enrollment. I understand that it works very well in the Twin Cities area. I know that there are several schools in uh, my Senate district that uh, are at or over 50% open enrolled, but uh, we allow the buses to travel way too far out of their assigned districts to pick these students up. There's got to be a better way to do that, and I think if we reduce some of the funding for those transportation uh, uh, miles, that uh, they will figure out a better way to do that. And then I think uh, we can just uh, close up some, we can create some revenue. Uh, we uh, wouldn't necessarily be a cut, but we could create some revenue by closing uh, uh, some of our uh, tax uh, uh, breaks, some of our tax breaks and corporate loopholes. Thank you. Uh, Bill, would you like a rebuttal? Yeah, please. Just a short, not a rebuttal, just a comment. I, I think we agree on some of, the, some of the issues here. But getting back to the prevailing wage, it just seems to me that the free markets uh, is way, the way this country was founded on. And uh, if, if a, a contractor is going to bid on a road job, uh, he should just bid on a road job against somebody else. It should be just, uh, just a, a, a free market attitude free market process uh, for us to have to pay upwards of 20 to 30 percent more. When you talk about the working folks, the working folks already work for the company. They know exactly how much they're making. Uh, they, they, you know, that's, that's just something that needs to go away as well as, I don't know if people understand that or not, but when you build a state building in the state of Minnesota, a certain percentage has to go to, of uh, the total price has to go to art in the vestibule or out in front of the, uh, the buildings. I mean, those kind of things were nice when we had a lot of money. But that compound of everything else has created the, the problems that we're looking at today, and they should go away. Thank you. Dan, would you like a rebuttal? No, I'm fine. All right. All right, then, Dan, the next question to you is name three areas where the state needs to increase spending. Well, uh, boy, I don't know if I can uh, pick just three. Uh, I think the uh, state needs to, well, pay back. Uh, public education, $2.4 billion still sitting out there that we owe them. And, uh, you know, when I talk to administrators and school boards, uh, they are not so worried about the amount they're getting, but they want it to be consistent and reliable. And uh, the last couple of legislative sessions, that has not been the case. Uh, one of the years I served, we gave everybody a $50 per student uh, one-time money. Uh, but then we also added to the formula and took it away. So I think uh, uh, educate, uh, an educated workforce, an educated society is critical, 
and we need to uh, make sure that we have some stable and, and fair money uh, being put into that. Uh, I think we need to do a better job with our uh, nursing homes, our long-term care facilities. They have not even gotten a cost of living adjustment in the last four or almost five years now. And uh, these are uh, people that are uh, pouring into the uh, long-term care facilities at, uh, at record numbers. Uh, we're finding some ways to uh, take care of them at home, assisted living, uh, in other ways. But at some point, they get to that point where they need that long-term care and they need that more acute care. And we are not uh, keeping up in our wage uh, scale in these facilities. These facilities are not being uh, kept up uh, as far as their structure and their infrastructure. And uh, so we need to put some more money in there. And uh, I just uh, put a plug in for uh, uh, tourism and, and farming probably under the same one. I'd like to see uh, a little more of uh, um, support go to organic and uh, uh, small farmers. And I'd also like us to see more money put into our AIS problem. Thank you. Bill, can you name three areas where the state needs to increase spending? Thank you for the question. And, and uh, you know, I, there, there's many different areas I can think about uh, that, that can, should increase. However, in order to increase, you have to decrease other areas. Uh, I'm glad uh, uh, Dan talked about K-12 education and, and the money that was borrowed before we actually took over two years ago. Two years ago, people should know that when, when we came into the, to the Senate, uh, we had a $5.6 billion deficit to, to deal with. And, of course, we have to do that, balance that according to the Constitution. And we did borrow over $700 million from the, uh, from the uh, K-12 education. And that was real unfortunate. However, in the last two years, we were able to pay that back. We would have paid the uh, last $430 million that we borrowed but Governor Dayton saw fit to actually veto that. And that's really unfortunate because now the school, school boards are going to have to go out and borrow money and also pay interest on that money, which they cannot recover. Uh, per student pupil fairness, uh, and I think Dan will probably agree with me, Minneapolis and St. Paul has been traditionally getting twice as much per student funding. And uh, for whatever reason, it's not working. For whatever reason, it's not working, and we out in rural Minnesota are, are uh, paying that. We're paying that bill. And uh, quite frankly, we should, be, we should be all equal throughout the state of Minnesota. Uh, what a student gets in, in, uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, uh, should not get any more than, than, uh, than a student that, that's going to school in, in Fergus Falls or Purim. And I'd like to see that back. Uh, and In fact, we are moving in that direction. And the private sector. The private sector should be looked at. Uh, we look at privatization of prison some years ago uh, in this very town we're standing in. Uh, there's, there's a prison standing empty here. And uh, myself and Representative Westrom worked tirelessly with uh, and fighting against the unions uh, to try and get uh, prisoners, uh, state prisoners over here because, quite frankly, they can do it 20 to $30 per day cheaper than the state of Minnesota. So um, there's all kinds of ways of, of, of funding state entities, and, and uh, I mean, we could just go on and on and on. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, would you like a rebuttal? Just a, a little bit, and I'm not sure that uh, Senator Ingebretson gave us uh, three places where he'd like to see us raise money, but I, I will say this about the school funding. Uh, 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 previous to the last two years, we had a very honorable man at the uh, head of education and uh, Senator Leroy Stumpf. And uh, all schools and all school children start at the same dollar amount. And then there is a series of formulas that are used. And the reason that uh, some of these schools get more money than others there are special needs within these school buildings. And uh, we in Minnesota have made a commitment that every student will get an opportunity to have an education. So if you need English as a second language, or if you have uh, minorities, if you are immigrants, uh, there are special costs that have come with that. And I don't think that we want to punish children for the sins of their parents. And that's why there is a, sure, we'd like to carry more money out into uh, a greater Minnesota for our education system. But there's a reason that there is not an equal amount going into every school. Bill, would you like a rebuttal? Yes, I would. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, when we talk about minorities, we talk about uh, uh, illegal or possibly illegal immigrants or immigrants. Uh, there should really be, they should really be not treated any different than anybody else in Minnesota. In Minnesota, we should all be one, and that is Minnesotans. And uh, the day and age of us funding... Uh, Funding schools that have have different uh, schools of different color, that that should be long gone in my book. It should be, and everybody should 
should be putting that way behind us. Special needs, I understand. Every school has special needs, and they need to be uh, treated the same as everybody else, and, they're, and it's a very expensive system. I understand that. But just because you're a school of minority, I don't think, uh, well, it's been proven, it's been proven time and again that those, throwing dollars at those particular schools has not brought the grade point up, and it's time that uh, rural Minnesota gets their share. Thank you, gentlemen. We have time for one more question. So, Bill, uh, this one we're going to start with you. Invasive species are becoming a serious threat to our waterways. Do you think the state should do more to prevent the spread of invasive species, and if so, how? Thank you for that question. Actually, I chair the Environmental Natural Resource Committee that, that all of those invasive species bills came through. Uh, I, I authored and co-authored some of those bills. Uh, I did author the the uh, the bill uh, that that actually does the enforcement part uh, you know for a couple of years now we've been actually encouraging the DNR as well as other local government entities to to educate the public on on the uh, the moving of uh, zebra mussel throughout our west central Minnesota lakes uh, and uh, frankly it had to come there had to come a time when in order to to uh, actually uh, um, mean business you you have to you have to have laws that that uh, that uh, the folks are going to have to if they're not if they're not going to pay attention to it they're they're in violation have we spent enough on invasive species i think quite frankly we gave the dnr enough money over the last biennium to the point where they can't even possibly spend the money that we gave them uh, through the bonding process through the governor's bonding bill we actually uh, worked with the uh, uh, coon rapids dam and make, made that into a hundred year flood uh, prevention there for the flying carp that are coming up from uh, from the southern states. Uh, we also did some funding through the legacy funding, uh, millions of dollars of legacy money that went into the barriers, electronic shock barriers and bubble barriers on the uh, uh, lock and dam system on the southern part of the state, as well as we spent four million dollars for the University of Minnesota research. Uh, Dr. Peter Sorensen, a uh, carp specialist, uh, is heading up that and has been in the university for many, many years. So we blew the dust off of that area of the university and uh, we're very optimistic, at least we're hopeful, that we can get some long-term solutions instead of just throwing money at the amount, like the amounts of money we threw at it this year. I know it takes a lot of money to get these projects started up, but quite frankly, uh, they, can't, they can't possibly spend it, but we should have some ongoing uh, maintenance money as well. Thank you. And Dan, invasive species are become a serious threat to our waterways. Do you think the state should do more to try to prevent the spread of invasive species, and if so, how? Well, you're right, Amy. They have uh, aquatic invasive species that are a real threat to our billions of dollars in tourism, uh, as well as property values around the state of Minnesota. Uh, the problem we have in the state of Minnesota, and it's quite obvious, is that our lakes and streams and rivers touch each other. And then about every four or five years, our rivers leave their banks and go over uh, land, and we have a hard time containing it. We're not like a lot of other states, but other states have chased this problem with millions and millions of dollars. Now, if Senator Ingebrigtsen said that the DNR has been given more money than they could possibly spend, then they need to put that money on the ground. Uh, I think back to when uh, bovine tuberculosis infected northeastern or northwestern Minnesota. They shut down an area. They went in there and cleaned it out. And I think the DNR just has to take a more proactive approach. Uh, when they're even checking boats on weekends, they know boaters go by them and will go to the next uh, access to uh, launch a boat. Uh, they may, if, if protecting our natural resources uh, means shutting down some public accesses, uh, then they have to have that ability. And the fines maybe aren't uh, harsh enough yet. This is a big deal, and it is a big deal for the vitality of Minnesota. And we need to, uh, uh, we need to be uh, stronger and keep, it's going to cost a lot of money to get the job done. Bill, would you like a short rebuttal? Yeah, just real quickly, uh, and uh, just, just to clarify, uh, uh, Dan, that we, uh, we, we definitely gave the DNR the authority to actually pull that very scenario, pull that boat over if they see them coming from the access or going to another access. If they have, if they have water leaking out the ba bo back of the boat or if they, even have a, uh, uh, if they even have a plug in the boat, they can be pulled over. And uh, so we've given the, the DNR the authority, and that's something I think that's a work in, a work in progress. Uh, uh, I, th I think, quite frankly, uh, we're going to see how this works. Uh, we're, we're, we've got two, two lakes, actually, in West Central Minnesota where we have a, a success stories. We're actually, uh, the substance that was put in after the, uh, the, the zebra mussels were found actually uh, cleared up the lake. So we're very optimistic that spending the money on research is going to be uh, some, some long-term solutions, and, 
and uh, hopefully that, that does help us with our the AIS issue in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Dan, would you like a short rebuttal? Just real quick, part of the problem remains that we're allowing these uh, seafaring vessels to come into our ports and dump their uh, tanks. And they are carrying these things uh, to us. Uh, and uh, we have to uh, start to uh, regulate that. And, and then I think our real savior is going to be uh, uh, the research and development that comes. We're going to have to count on science to help us figure this out. Uh, so uh, uh, not all of the money should be going in to uh, the, uh, the lake stops and the checks and the washing of the boats. We have to continue to fund that education piece as well because I think that's really where the answer is going to come from. Thank you, gentlemen. That's all the time we have for questions this evening, and we will now move on to the closing remark. Both candidates will have two minutes to give their closing remarks, and we will begin with Bill Ingebrigtsen, the Republican candidate for Senate District 8. Bill? Thank you very much again for having us. Uh, six years ago, I, I came into the Senate with, uh, with Dan Scogan. We as freshmen, uh, at that point in time, enjoyed a $2 billion surplus in the uh, state coffers. Over the next four years, in, under the leadership of the DFL Senate, that was turned around to a $5.6 billion deficit. Folks, that's almost an $8 billion turnaround in dollars. Minnesotans sent us there to fix that or do, do something different. Again, continuously for 38 years until that point, the DFL had controlled the Minnesota Senate. Minnesotans were ready for something different. We went there. We actually... We actually uh, uh, solved that budget crisis. We actually ended up with a billion dollar surplus. We actually were able to pay back the school shifts that we, we actually uh, incurred to actually uh, uh, take care of their deficit. And if you send me back to St. Paul, you will see a lot more work that will be done. And we're, we're government, the bloating of government is going to stop. It has stopped. And there's going to be reductions to the point where that are going to be manageable. And uh, the state of Minnesota has, has demanded that we cut down the state of Minnesota, the size of it, the scope of it. Government needs to get out of their face. That's why they've sent us there. And if you send me back there, I will work on doing just that for the, the, for the folks in West Central Minnesota. And thank you again for having us. Thank you, Bill. And now we'll listen to the closing remarks from the DFL candidate, Dan Scogan. Dan? Well, thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you also for uh, having me here this evening. I'll just uh, preface my closing remarks by saying that uh, we have not solved our budget deficit. We have not balanced our budget. Uh, the current uh, leadership uh, took a uh, four and a half, five billion dollar uh, deficit, and uh, in January they're telling us we're going to be at about three and a half billion again. You can say you're balanced if you took some, still have some cash in your wallet after you paid your minimum on your credit cards. But we still owe the schools over $2 billion. We're going to have about a $1 billion in inflation. We've raised about $300 billion in property taxes. We uh, spent, uh, uh, froze the uh, local government aid for uh, local units of government now after uh, giving them a cut. And uh, we're spending taxpayers' money now to uh, try to defend uh, colleagues who had uh, indiscretions. And uh, so uh, I'm just telling you that uh, Bill Engelbretson has served the uh, area in the state of Minnesota well, in law enforcement, at the state senate, but uh, we need to move in a different direction. We cannot continue in the state of Minnesota to manage one crisis after another. Bill did not talk about raising any revenue. He did not talk about fixing these uh, structural imbalances that are causing us to go from one crisis to the next. If you send me to St. Paul, I'll go to work and I will help you uh, solve the state's problems. We have to start fixing the problems. Thank you, Dan. That concludes tonight's evening of Meet the Candidates. I hope you've enjoyed this program. I'd like to thank the candidates for joining us tonight, and I'd like to thank the viewers for calling in with their questions. Remember, your voice is important. Make sure your voice is heard by voting on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you for watching Meet the Candidates. We invite you to join us next time for another opportunity to ask questions for the candidates running for office. On behalf of Pioneer Public Television, thank you for watching.